Hi, everyone. Welcome to the new museum. Thank you for being here on this rainy afternoon. My name's Alethea Rockwell, and I'm the Keith Herring Director of Education and Public Engagement here. You're here today for Generations, Judy Chicago, Chabalala Self, and Camille Enro in conversation. So I'll start with a land acknowledgement to recognize that the new museum is on the unceded land of the Lenape people, who were the original inhabitants of Manhattan. And as we gather here this afternoon, we begin by paying our respects to the Lenape past, present, and future. So today is really a celebratory day. We're celebrating the final days of Judy Chicago's exhibition, Herstory, curated by Massimiliano Gioni, Gary Carrion Moriari, Margot Norton, and Madeline Weisberg. And the show has been a really amazing, relevant experience for audiences and critics alike over the past month. We're really grateful to have Judy back at the museum um, for its final weekend. Judy hardly needs an introduction from me. Her 60-year career is legendary in feminist art and activism, and her work challenging the institutions of art and art history has paved the way for so many women in the field. And if you haven't had a chance to see this amazing exhibition yet, please go after the talk. We're open tonight until 6 p.m., and tomorrow is the final day. So spend time in it while you can. Judy is going to be joined in conversation today by two artists, Chabalala Self and Camille Enro. And the three of them share some topics of interest, including the depiction of the female body, motherhood, mortality, environmental catastrophe. So for about an hour, the three of them will discuss affinities and contrasts across their approaches to art and feminism, moderated by Massimiliano Gioni, the new museum's Edlis Neeson artistic director. And then they will take some questions from you at the end, so you can think about your questions. Chabalala Self uses painting and printmaking to explore ideas surrounding the black body. She predominantly constructs depictions of women using a combination of sewn, printed, and painted materials across different artistic and craft traditions. And Camille Enro works across drawing, painting, sculpture, installation, and film, inspired by literature, secondhand marketplaces, poetry, cartoons, social media, self-help, and the banality of everyday life. Enro's work captures the complexity of living as both private individuals and global citizens in an increasingly connected and overstimulated world. Before we get started, a quick thank you to the new museum education staff who make these programs happen, the one and only Austin D. Bowes and Derek Wright. Thank you so much. Thank you to Chabalala and Camille for being here and sharing your work with us. And thank you, Judy, for your brilliant exhibition and for your vision for a feminist world. With that, it's a pleasure to pass things over to Massimiliano. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you, Alicia. I, I also want to thank the entire team of the New Museum. I see many friends and colleagues here. Um, as you've seen, I hope, from the show, it's a very complex, rich um, exhibition that really required the entire museum to come together. And so I'm just standing here as a kind of figurehead, but it's really, uh, it took more than a village. It took a village or two. <laughs> and, uh, and I think, I hope you can sense that energy as you go through the show. I should also say that if you have missed this show, which would be crazy of you to do so because you're sitting here, or if you want more, the exhibition will travel in a different form uh, to Arles in uh, France this summer, um, opening on June 29th at the Luma Foundation, and uh, Judy will also inaugurate a special exhibition at the Serpentine this coming May. So if you're in Europe, it's going to be a Judy Chicago Bonanza, and make sure you don't miss those shows. <laughs> um, given the weather today, I have to make my usual Ervin Panofsky show that uh, many of you have heard before. Now, uh, Ervin Panofsky, the great art historian, used to say that you could recognize if people were from Hamburg, because between going to paradise or a lecture about paradise, they would always go to the lecture. And <laughs> so I want to acknowledge that many of you might have German origins or come from Hamburg. And thank you for braving the weather and for being out here today. Uh, 
the secret for this panel is that there isn't really any curatorial logic for bringing these great artists together. I think the impetus was really that um, there are three of my favorite and the institution's also favorite artists and favorite people. So I'm also very happy, very moved to conclude this exhibition in their company. And without further ado, I will jump into the first question to, to Judy. Um, we are here today with representatives, I think, from two or three generations or more. And um, uh, in this exhibition, we wanted to emphasize not only your work as an artist, but also your work as a curator, organizer, archivist, uh, uh, pedagogue, uh, and teacher. And so I actually want to start from that aspect of your practice that maybe is less known, which is your work as a teacher and as a pedagogue. Uh, you published a wonderful book about actually teaching and studio practice and thought a lot. You created a, um, an entire program, first at Fez, Fresno and then at CalArts, that um, was focused on the work of women artists. So I want to ask you, first of all, how you approach teaching and uh, your ideas around pedagogy and uh, what you taught or learned from different generations uh, throughout your work. Yeah, that's usually my second joke, which is N the NSA has done the lights for us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> also, I've been joking that New Yorkers are a lot tougher than Donald and me, my husband. We were from New Mexico. I looked at the out the window, and I'm like, oh, nobody's going to show up. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Camille, and I, we both had the same idea. Uh, it's so interesting to me about how people talk about my teaching because actually I have taught at institutions all told exactly six years. And um, two of them, when I started the feminist art program at Fresno and CalArts, two or three, and then the other three it, at the end of the 90s when Donald and I, Donald, I never had a house of my own. My parents never had a house of their own. And at a certain point, Donald's like, we have to have a house of our own. So we had absolutely no money. And Donald's like really brilliant. He started out in architecture, although he's a photographer. And he spent three years renovating and restoring an old railroad hotel. and. I turned 60 and I had my first mortgage. And I'm like, oh God, now I have to make money. Now I never thought about making money because I come from a generation of artists where nobody ever thought that they were gonna make money from art. The idea was to be taken seriously as an artist. But anyway, so I did some years of residencies, short-term residencies at various institutions around the country and one of the things I was interested in was to see, because it had been 25 years since I taught in an institution, and I was interested to see what the state of studio art education was at that point, at the end of the 90s and beginning of the 2000s. And from my perspective, it was abysmal, which prompted me to write uh, the only book I ever wrote on teaching called Institutional Time, which is how I felt about the years of teaching then. <laughs> but I think that the idea about my being a teacher comes from the fact that I have taught through art. And as everybody knows who knows anything about my career, when I was a young artist and facing challenges because of my gender, and I started looking back to see if there were um, any women before me who had uh, faced and overcome the challenges I was encountering, and that's when I discovered this incredible cultural history that is enshrined on the fourth floor in the City of Ladies, uh, probably for the first time. That work has been brought together. Anyway, I set out with the hubris of youth 
to teach women's history through my paintbrush. Me, all by myself, was going to overturn centuries of erasure. You have to be young to think of that. <laughs> anyway, so when I saw the power of art, which I saw through the dinner party, it sort of set me on a path to continue, particularly when I took up subjects that were absent, people didn't know anything about, like, in the 80s, the subject of birth, there were like, it was before Frida Kahlo's My Birth painting was even known. She was just Diego Rivera's wife who also painted. And um, it, I just did an Instagram post uh, because the other night, 45 years after the dinner party opened at the San Francisco Museum, and there were lines around the block there were lines around the block here, too. So that's how I've taught. I've taught through art. Um, we'll come back. I think we'll take turns with questions and answers, and then we'll return to you. Um, I will now switch to Camille. Um, actually, I don't know if you ever taught. I'm curious, or if you are ever interested in, in teaching. But the second and main question was um, about um, your work throughout your career, and also most recently around the depiction or the experience of motherhood. You published recently two books, quite beautiful ones. One is called Mother Tongue which is a collection of images and artwork, and another one called Milky Ways, which is a collection of essays about your feeling um, around motherhood and, and art in relation to, to motherhood. Um, so first of all, I'm curious if you ever taught or if you are uh, teaching as, through your work as well, and if you can tell us a little bit more about the way in which uh, uh, the subject of motherhood intersects with your work. And maybe we can see the images if you like. Um, no, I, I've done workshops and studio visits, but I've never really teaching per se. Um, I think the, the um, I mean, I think in a way to connect the two questions, I think the experience of um, making works uh, in relationship with motherhood is much more an experience of becoming a child than becoming a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a lot of uh, what triggers the work I've, I've been doing was more the rediscovery of language and how, like, what happens when you don't have words to say things. And uh, as a caregiver, you have constantly to project into um, your own child to understand what he needs for. And, and this is kind of like a big trip projecting you into the moment in, of your life when you had no words to say things. So that adventure, the adventure of, of the work, around motherhood is more an exploration of the early stage of life and how it teaches us uh, about um, sexuality, about death, about uh, play, uh, and how also play and art uh, making are connected. Uh, you know, as a foreigner, I have the experience of not having the words quite frequently, um, which I'm sure you have to. And, uh, you, as I mentioned, you titled this book Mother Tongue, and when I saw it, I was reminded that um, Dante, the Italian poet, spoke of uh, um, milk tongue. No? The mother tongue for him was la lingua latte, because you supposedly learn the language as you are drinking the, the mother's milk. Um, you have two kids now. Are they bilingual? And it's not, I'm not prying. I'm curious yeah, yeah. how that <laughs> venture is going. <laughs> They are trilingual, actually. Trilingual. Yeah. And uh, have your ideas around mother tongues and, uh, and their relationship of teaching and mutual learning have changed? And how have that experience had an impact on your own work? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think the, the, um, one of the main um, uh, thing about language is how, it's how words are small compared to the things they are supposed to define. And this is something I think you, you understand when you speak different language, but this is also something you understand when you have small children and they start understanding that a word don't apply to certain context. 
and and that also there is experience that cannot be um, spoken or uh, described. Um, so I guess there's um, the experience of, of of being around some of children was was triggering for me, especially in in relationship to this uh, nonverbal communication, and how also it connects us to. Um, other type of uh, kind, you know, animals and, and and the world around us and how we can um, actually through, you know, this um, questioning of language and the authority of language. Um, it, I, I think really the authority of language is really the first thing that's collapsing. Uh, especially, it, it does feel to me like speaking about motherhood is like a brick uh, you take a brick from a building and the whole building collapse because everything you're supposed to know, all the foundation, uh, seems to be very fragile. Because because when life starts, everything has to be, nothing is taken from granted. So it is an experience of teaching, but I, I guess it's more an experience of rediscovering how things are not, um, um, I don't know how, how to describe it, but... Yeah, the, the, the impermanence and the how things are f flying away as you try to describe them. Yeah. And in, in uh, both books, Sarah, sorry, go I ahead. Yeah. Could I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm very interested. Can you uh, use the mic? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very interested in this work of yours called Wet Job. Do you have it in the slides? I was wondering if you, if you do. I was wondering oh, yeah, if you I'm could. Sure it's in the slide, actually. I was wondering if you could talk about it. Um, yeah, so it, it's a it's a painting of a woman um, pumping, a milk. Uh, pumping milk. Um, it's um, I. The experience of breast pumping is something I had never projected myself into um, ever. <laughs> I, I didn't even know that much in, uh, existed. I, I didn't really anticipate and uh, thought too much about motherhood before I had children, even though I had I was 40 when it happened, but um, 40. 40. 40. Oh, 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it reminds me a, a, a story uh, where, um, but anyway, no, I'm, I'm going to reply to the question. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a portrait of a woman attached to a breast pump, yeah. and um, I realized when that situation happened to me that I, it was uh, difficult to describe and difficult to understand what was happening because I had no, I had not seen representation of it, I had not read books where uh, the thoughts of a woman being attached to a breast pump were described. And, and so I, it, do, it did feel also that there was something lit connected to the idea of ruminating, thinking, because the, 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 shush, shush, the machine was very meditative. Also because the stillness, you cannot really move and there's not much you can do. So um, it, it, it occurred to me that it was an interesting situation, but also unspoken and described, and and so this is the, the the beginning of wanting to do that painting. It's a very powerful painting, at least I thought so. Thank you. <laughs> I want to ask a question to Shabalala, uh, and then of course we return to everybody. Um, I, I think your work has been um, now associated largely with representations of women, and uh, um, and you have used techniques that often are described as craft, as textile, techniques that Judy herself has um, used. And, and I think in similar way, you and Judy have also shared a, a critique of certain assumptions around these forms of craft that are usually identified as feminine, as mm, of less value than academic painting, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, I wanted to ask you where your interest or fascination with the representations of women's body and uh, uh, and I feel by the way 
as also a result from the exhibition that every time I say the word woman or feminine, I should be air quoting like crazy because we, <laughs> uh, we, we face a moment also in which the very definition of, uh, um, of genders are extremely... Which I hope we're going to take up. Yeah, we will discuss that in a second. But um, so returning to, to your work, I wanted to, to hear about the genesis of your interest and, and how you approach uh, such a thing. Um, the genesis of my interest in the female body is um, was initially kind of a investigation into to better understand myself, but also I come from a family with a lot of women. I have like four. Well, I'm one of I have five siblings, and there's four four girls in that family, and I'm the youngest in my family. So I spend a lot of time like watching and observing my older sisters. Um, outside of my older sisters, my mother was just like a huge matriarchal figure in my life and all of our lives. And my mother was the first person that I saw ever like sewing. So she, she did this as a hobby. Um, it wasn't her primary job, but it was something that she would do just to entertain herself kind of as a creative outlet. So sewing um, was always kind of in my subconscious as like a gay avenue for creativity. So when I was in graduate school, and I really was looking for a, a way to approach painting um, from my own kind of aesthetic framework. I, I, I happened to, I, re, I kind of rediscovered sewing as an opportunity to do that. It was a way for me to speak about my childhood, um, kind of engage in nostalgia, bring in these objects or these materials that were like of the world, um, basically various textiles, and also um, just formally deconstruct painting. Um, in graduate school and during my academic career, there's a lot of conversations about painting, the relevance of painting, the future of painting, how painting is rooted in like, Eurocentric ideas of art history or even like masculine ideas of art history. So I started to really think about like what is the foundation of a painting and it's canvas. So kind of thinking, kind of re-introducing re, um, the idea into my mind that the foundation of this art form is really a textile. And kind of leaning into that allowed me to bring more textiles and different kinds of fabrics and materials into my practice. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that answers the question. But um, the female figure, yeah, I'm a, I'm a woman, so I've always been interested in investigating what does that mean, what does it mean to myself, what does it mean to others. But um, outside of that, I think that um, the female body is significant to all people because it's, you know, the point of origin, is the point of entry into this sphere, into this plane. Um, so I think culturally it's, it's the symbolic of just our, our shared origin story. So that's another reason why I'm, my practice is dedicated to investigating um, the female figure. And actually we met and you, the, the first presentation you had at the New Museum was in an exhibition called Trigger, uh, Gender as a Tool and a Weapon that uh, my colleague Joanna Burton, who's now the director at um, LA Monka organized. And um, I, I mean, I'm not so curious about how you felt in the context of that show, but um, it was an exhibition that obviously focused on, let's say, gender as a performance or as a cultural construct. And um, I was curious to see how you saw your work in dialogue with the works in, in that moment. And, uh, and you know, more broadly, which maybe is an oversimplistic question, is um, I guess as a representative of the youngest <laughs> among us on this stage, if and how ideas of feminism uh, were uh, influential and are influential to your work and, and in what declination or what does that word mean to you today? I think that feminism is, you always have to understand it as, a, as it intersects with other identity politics. So obviously like race, class, nationality. Um, so in that regard, I feel like um, my take on feminism is obviously different than any other woman. Than every, I think every woman probably has a unique experience with it. Um, I think also too, feminism is often understood in relation to like the positionality of, the, of a man, of a male figure. So if you're, I guess, if, if, you're, if your male counterpart is one that has a lot of privilege, I think it's a reaction to that. But as if you're, I think for people of color, oftentimes the male counterpart doesn't retain the same amount of privilege as like this, like a white male figure. So I think it becomes complicated in terms of how, to, how does feminism 
interact with race? How does feminism interact with um, sexuality? How does feminism interact with class as well? Um, because I think that those all those nuances are things that inform each individual's person, each individual's relationship to feminism and how it can play out in their practice and in their work. Um, I would say that my work is equally about womanhood as it is about blackness. So in that regard, it's kind of two, it's these two shared identity politics that are being kind of discussed in relation to like this, this general conversation that's happening in like mainstream society. Because I feel like if you're coming from a marginalized community or a community that's made to feel marginalized, you're still outside of the mainstream. Um, so that's generally how I kind of explain my positionality in regard to feminism. And in regard to gender, um, and in that show, I, because my works are always like kind of fashioned, I always spoke about our identities being fashioned as well. They are not entirely inherent. Um, there's some aspects to our identities, our personas that are placed upon us, that are absorbed over the course of a lifetime. So there's a, um, it's a, it's a costume, part of it's a costume. So not to say that every aspect of one's identity is not real, whatever that really, what that means, but um, I, think that, I think that it's a, it's a mix of things. And I really tried to communicate that idea visually in how my figures are constructed. Um, they are quite obviously constructed, which kind of speaks to the reality that all of, all of us are constructs to some degree. Uh, so today I'll return to you and uh, and obviously feel free to interrupt and ask each other questions if you have anything. Um, I, I mean, I hinted to, to this earlier. The, I actually have two questions. First of all, as you were growing up and becoming an artist, you have spoken openly about how in the first 10 years of your professional career, you felt you wanted to fit in in what, in retrospect, you would have understood was a very masculine art world. Um, and then somewhat around 1970, you consciously decided to um, to become a feminist artist. I'm probably oversimplifying and I actually wanna ask you if that- There was no term, feminist Yes, artist. so that's right. what I wanna, so how did that come about in even in absence of terms? And, and how was that process of change and discovery in retrospect, how would you describe it? Since, since I know you're gradually moving to the construct of women, why don't we start with Shabalala and go the opposite direction in terms of generation? You started talking about this in terms of how you see what has, as the writer Susan Gubar mentioned in an academic conference, become an invalid term. So why don't we go the opposite direction generationally to discuss that? And sorry, the question is, I'm sorry, I missed But the in a sense, you, you alluded to it in speaking of how throughout your work, even the materiality of the work, you are emphasizing the notion of gender as a construction or as a or as fashion, no, as you said. So I think what Judy is asking you is if you think this even the term woman is in itself becoming valid at this point. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm yeah. misrepresenting your question. And I don't know if that's even a question you ask yourself, but I think that's what she was asking. I feel like an interpreter. I don't know why. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know if Massimiliano sent you these questions the same way. Well, each one received me. different questions. Yeah, well, but I mean, it is a definitely a generational question in terms of the use of the word woman, the idea of the construct of womanhood or femininity. And as I was reading this article about an academic conference, there was a reference to a writer, a literary critic named Susan Gubar, who you may not be familiar with, but I am, because she came. She and a, a colleague wrote a book called The Mad Woman in the Attic in the 70s that was exceedingly influential in terms of literary theory and the marginalization of women's voices. And so 
Massimiliano raised this as a topic, and I know it's a topic that has a lot of re resonance for younger generations, but as Susan mentioned at this academic conference, which was about feminist theory, and in terms of feminism being personal, I mean, feminism is a philosophy that goes back 500 years. So yes, one can have a personal definition of how that philosophy applies to you, but it's not personal in the same way that like what you have for breakfast is personal. It's actually a philosophical structure. So I thought since Massimiliano broached this, we should take it up and discuss the changing definitions around gender. Susan describes being at this conference on feminist theory where this man delivered a whole talk and never mentioned the word woman. And when he was queried about it, he was like, why is that relevant? <laughs> but it really does grow out of this idea that there's no such thing as women as a category. Sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, um, I think the, um, I mean, we were, earlier I was saying, like I have a problem with words and it started when I was pregnant. Um, it, it didn't occur to me that words started to look smaller and smaller compared to the realities they were supposed to define. And I think when it comes to the, the word women, the word mother, the word father, the word children, um, those categories seem definitely um, that they are overwhelmingly floating out of their box. And, and this is something that I feel we are constantly caught into the dynamic between what's, um, you were talking, Judy, about like it's not, feminism is not as personal uh, as a definition as what you would get for breakfast, which is very uh, interesting <laughs> and I like metaphor. But I think when it comes to women and feminism, but also other concepts, uh, I think we are caught with this uncomfortable dynamic between uh, what's subjective and what is universal. And I think when it comes to women, because we live in a patriarchal society, we've always been, w the category women has had prejudice attached to it since centuries. And those prejudices are very difficult to overcome. They are very difficult to accept. I myself, when I started to work on and I don't want even to say motherhood because it's not the topic of my work. I corrected Massimiliano and I said it's early development of children is the reverse and the rediscovery of language because I was embarrassed to say I had children when I was interviewed about those work because I was afraid of what it would mean for those people. They would immediately say, oh, this work is not about language. It's not about Roland Barthes and the pleasure of text. It's not about playing with the mother body. It's about her. It's about her own experience. It's personal. And then they would immediately discard that work as totally subjective and personal. And I think we women, our own personal, our own subjectivity has always been discarded. And the whole, everything connected with women has been considered subjective and uh, secondary for so many centuries that I think it's normal that there is still a problem with those words and it's still complicated to define them, and there's still a, even a resistance to accept you know, their meaning as a closed box. And, uh, and I want to add that in actually this book, uh, Milky Ways, there's a chapter called After School, where um, I realized that when I was pregnant for the second time, I would only want to dress with uh, men clothes I mean, there was also economical reason, and there was COVID, it was complicated, but also I realized that I like to entertain myself with the idea that I was a bourgeois man, you know, man spreading in the subway. <laughs> and then when I walk, all of a sudden everybody move away, which 
never happens because I'm usually not taking so much space. And then I, I started to entertain myself with this idea that, yeah, I am this bourgeois man of the cartoons, of the French cartoons who's smoking cigar, and I can, I can take much more space. And then as I was going, I also realized my own children, the first one also wouldn't accept to be defined as a boy. He neither wanted to be a girl or a boy, he wanted to be a dog. And, <laughs> and I, it seemed to me that that was also, like, like me, he was going through a rebellion against the definition, the too narrow definition of those words, woman, man, children, dog. Uh, and I, I think it is an embarrassing question. It is difficult because uh, also when you belong to a category that has been ostracized and diminished and uh, not taken seriously for centuries, it, it, it's complicated to, to accept, embrace, and, and to, to, to keep that box. You want to put the box in, in the trash. <laughs> Um, in terms of like if I if I identify with the word woman or if I believe that it's a valid word, um, it's a word that I use in my practice and it's a word that I use to describe my figures. Um, so yeah, it's not and it's also nothing. It's not very. It's been something that I've questioned either, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I don't. I've never. I haven't really given it much thought, to be honest with you. It's something that's always felt quite like natural to say in terms of describing myself and describing my figures. And I feel like anyone that says that probably feels similarly that I, that I, to how I feel. Um, I think that words are limiting. You can't really describe the complexity of realities that you described very, very well, Camille, with the words, the language that we have available to us. I think that's why we've all probably decided to become artists because you know art allows you to kind of be more expansive. Um, art allows you to kind of explain things that there's really no nuance for just with language. Um, there's, a po there's a poetry to art that kind of fills in gaps that where language falls short, where society falls short. I think a lot of times art is there to, to create images or circumstances that are more aspirational that may or may not actually ever be actualized um, in this present time. So I think that it's something that is very that is complicated, and I think that it's something that's also evolving. So it's hard for me to say anything definitive on it because I haven't even fully resolved all of my own opinions and ideas around it. It's something that I'm still I'm starting to I'm starting to think about, and I'm still kind of coming to some kind of resolution about. But maybe there really is no real resolution about it. Maybe it becomes a situation where, again, people have to kind of come to their own personal truth in regard to like what's their own answer, and people have to feel comfortable in that, having their own personal answer to a complex question. Because um, it's really, again, a question about origin, like who are any of us really? And then generally, like my work speaks about that as well. Yes, ostensibly my work is about womanhood and is, is about blackness and all these different forms of identity, but there's a whole other parallel universe in my practice where my work is simply about what it means to inhabit a body, like this vehicle, a flesh suit, essentially. So I'm always kind of having these competing ideas existing at once. Um, of course we live in the world, of course in the world we live in states, we live under cultural norms and political systems and oppressions, but I also believe in a spiritual aspect of all of us where we are also living in a universe, something that's like kind of beyond and outside of all of that. But you have to be a sane person and a functional person in society. I think you have to entertain both those realities despite the fact that they compete with one another. Um, you have to have space in your mind to you know, understand both those things at once. Um, so yeah. Well, I think Massimiliano's question, since I have followed a lot of the discourse around the word woman, I think that's what he was raising because as Susan pointed out, and maybe you just, and I was too, very outside of academia. So it seemed insane to me. 
to tell you the truth because I'm like, to whom is this addressed, this discourse? Is it addressed to the women in Afghanistan who are not able to get educated, not able to work, not able to enjoy any of the kind of freedoms we enjoy because they're women? Is it addressed to the girls who are generally mutilated and who are never going to have the level of sexual pleasure that's available to us, privileged women. And that's like privileged women in the West, even though there's a ranking of privilege, which we all know. So for me, who has a kind of global perspective, it seemed entirely preposterous to even have this debate because it's relevant to whom. I mean, I totally understood what Camille was talking about, about feeling constrained. I love the thing about taking on. I mean, there's a page in one of my sketchbooks that I forgot all about, but was in my first retrospective at the De Young, if I were a man. And then it lists all these things. I forgot sitting with my legs spread. <laughs> I forgot that particular <laughs> um, level of assumption. So I, th I, th I expected actually that both of you would give different answers. So I, I'm very surprised and heartened by your answers, which do, even though they acknowledge the complexity of issues around gender. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, people make all these assumptions about my generation of feminists. You know, like, when I was in my studio in the 60s, I wasn't going around saying, I, a woman, am making this mark. I was being an artist. And I totally agree with you that art provides one of the few language forms we have to reach across all these categories if an artist chooses to reach across rather than work within them. And it was only when I walked out the door that I was confronted by social construction of gender or the social construction of motherhood. And, you know, a lot of women artists of my generation were completely destroyed by the struggle between could I be a woman and an artist too? And gender identity. And how, how to do that. Yeah. If you were, that was it. If you were a mother, you were disqualified. Yeah. I mean, I think it's still fear, to be honest. I mean, I, as I said before, I... I I really tried to hide the fact that I had children, um, but I also didn't want it to work on that. It was not really intentional. Uh, it just came because I felt I needed it for myself. I needed to understand what I was going through. I was extremely depressed. I had terrible postpartum depression. So I, it did feel like the CK myself was just breaking into pieces and I had to collect the pieces and the way collecting the pieces that were the most natural was making artwork with it. But um, I think that the, um, the, the, the reception of the work was encouraging. Uh, and I think I, that's where the privilege of living in a different generation, maybe. Um, and um, I felt supported uh, by many women curator, mostly. Um, and other artists, especially like books that came before Moira Davy, the mother reader. But I, I mean, to go back to <laughs> where you want to go, um, I think the, I think for our generation, I mean, we are a slightly different generation actually, but um, I do feel the words are necessary 
uh, and they, they shouldn't be disqualified. What I was just trying to say is more that um, since those words exist since centuries and, 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 the, and they exist within the context of patriarchy, um, the, the problems around them and their limits is something that um, is, is uh, for me natural. It feels natural that it's complicated and it feels natural that there is a struggle around it. Um, Marguerite Duras, I remember, said something that I, I, I kept thinking about it when I was making the works uh, around the things I wanted to talk about. She said, it's not motherhood itself who's a monster, it's the institution of motherhood. And I think that there's, um, in, in the same way, I also discover myself that the, that's really, you know, at that moment, you confront, like, you, you're no longer an artist. The doctors, everybody, just see you as a woman, like a woman's body, and 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 that maybe also is part of the breaking of the psyche and the little pieces together is how the whole society. Uh, you understand that this definition. You said you understood the definition of womanhood and how and the struggle it is to be a woman when you go out of your studio and you go out in the world and you try to conquer the world. And I did felt the same, even though I'm younger. I did felt that also because I worked in the music industry. I, I did music videos when I started, and it was mostly men. I was the only woman around. So I did experience the, um, um, sexual harassment, dirty jokes, um, people constantly thinking you as the assistant or the intern on the stage. Like this kind of situation where you're constantly being um, um, made to feel you're not at the right place. But this uh, became, I think, harder for me when I had children, like because that's where the moment where I realized the whole world has expectation on women that are actually much more heavy and much more difficult to carry that I imagine. In a way, it did feel like like reaching another level of prejudice. It's, uh, that's what I've observed. It's not that younger women, well, that younger women don't experience that realization until way older than I was when I realized it. And that's a plus in the sense that you have, a, you have more space to be yourselves for longer. But it was like when Tracy Emin at 40 makes a film about why the boys are making more money than her, it's like, duh! <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's interesting. I mean, that's one of the things I got out of this intergenerational conversation on this subject is that apparently you haven't encountered it yet. I haven't encountered um, sexism? Yeah. No, of, co of course <laughs> I have encountered sexism, yeah. I mean, I, I just, I guess my thing is that um, I've encountered sexism, I've encountered racism, racism right. but I don't, neither of those things make me not want to be a woman or black, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. So like, um, I'm still happy to be myself, and um, I'm actually thankful to understand people in a way that maybe people who don't experience those things wouldn't under wouldn't know. I feel like it actually makes me, it gives me insight into how people really are, and I need that insight to be an artist. So in some ways, I'm thankful for that depth of knowledge. If that makes any sense, um, I. It's not something that is joyful. Those experiences are not joyful, but they're not, they're valuable, if that makes any sense, <laughs> so. Well, well, yeah, I mean, it makes you understand the world. Yeah. As opposed to being like baffled by it, right? Um, to be baffled by it, to just being in living in a delusion, you know? I feel like I'm living in reality. Um, I need to be able to see things clearly to be a great artist, you know? So, um, and I think that's why a lot of the greatest artists are people who are on the margins of society, because they know how society really works. 
Very interesting. Did Last you expect year. these answers when you raised no, that question? That's, that's why we have the conversation. <laughs> I, I want to ask a question, uh, actually two questions. I don't know if we have time. Um, one is about role models, which maybe is an antiquated notion, but you were talking about, you know, Tracy Emin realizing uh, that boys are paid more when she's 40. I mean, obviously the value of role models is immense when learning how to deal also with um, with these uh, forms of marginalization. I, you know, Judy, you have spoken, for example, of the influence that Anna Isnin had on your work and your thinking, particularly as writing. I'm curious if each of you had specific roles when it came to also think of yourself as a woman artist or feminist artist or, you know, who were your cardinal points, if any, now, even as a reaction against. I always ask artists if you work against somebody, no? rather than in emulation of someone. And so I'm curious if you have an yeah, answer. Let's start with the youngest and go to the <laughs> oldest. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I really see myself as being non-reactionary, to be honest. Like, I don't see myself working against people. I feel like this is not very gener productive for me. This is a personal thing, though, just given my personality. It's not political. It's just, I'm just not a reactionary kind of person. Um, but, yeah, I see myself being, like, in line with other artists. Um, there are many artists that I see myself um, having been inspired by. I want to mention Faith Ringel because that's a project that we worked on together to like at the museum. That was a, definitely one of the main people I imagine as being like a foremother for me. Asa Denga McCann would be another artist. I also love Anais Nen. I actually have every single one of her books. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, really? Oh, God. So, no, there are so many yeah. younger people who don't even know who she is. Oh, I'm obsessed with all her writing, yeah. Wow. But um, I actually read all of her stuff right before I went to graduate school. Um, I had a friend who was like really into her books, and then I got me really into it. I never, like, I didn't know anything about it before. I wasn't even into that genre of writing. But... Um, it was somewhat analogous to a different genre of writing. I used to like when I was a kid, these books by a guy named Donald Goyne, the kind of like 70s, like pulp fiction, fiction like black exploitation type novels. But I felt like there was some kind of through line there. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, Judy, you're one of my art icons as well. I mean, there's so many artists that I feel like I think about and I would like to pay homage to in my work. I, I rather focus on that generally and making, um, thinking about people that I want to see my work in, in line with, as opposed to like working against certain narratives. Um, no, I, I, I definitely work against things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I wish I could be a more positive force in this world, but... Um, um, I relate. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I, I, I work a lot with anger. Um, I think it's a very strong motivation. I, I work a lot with things I cannot solve. Um, you know what? The things I cannot solve. Problems. Uh, actually, I remember I, I ordered on eBay this book, Unsolved Problems. It's a mathematical problem, but I had it on my desk, even though I'm not really interested in mathematics. But as a reminder, that's my topic. <laughs> Can I make the joke? I, you know, Camille and I met when I was working on the Venice Biennale, where she then premiered Gross Fatigue. They won the um, Silver Lion as best artwork, and we met actually in the cafe here, uh, just out of an email exchange. And I was telling her that my biennial was about knowing everything, and she told me she was making a work about the birth of the universe. And I thought it's like girls interrupted like two crazy people in a mental hospital. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be yeah, yeah. the start I, of a great friendship. And so. I remember I told you, I, yeah, and, and you asked, when can it be ready? And I said, in 10 years. <laughs> and you said, oh, but can it be ready in six months? <laughs> <laughs> it was. Judy, who were your... Um, uh, did you work against, actually? Or, you didn't finish, though, if you had specific yeah, models. Um, I was waiting to hear who she, what she reacted against. No, no, I, no I mostly, I think I was um, reacting against... I mean... I was mostly reacting against like more theory, like Freud, for example, was one thing I was unhappy with, but interested, but unhappy with. So constantly writing notes under the page where I disagree. 
um, until I found other author who had written full books about it, and then I stopped doing that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think I, I was interested in, in things I disagree with, and mostly it was mostly men because it was mostly it was the, the culture that felt dominant. I did had a few um, role model and and in more in the sense that you describe like somebody else who went through the same itinerary, the same struggle, and achieved really good results and feel like somebody I could want to look alike. And I remember Louise Bourgeois was one of them because she was French, because she went to New York, because she didn't have good relationship with her family, like many reasons I'm not going to enter in all the details. But uh, And there was also um, writers, a lot of writers. Um, there was... Uh, Marguerite Duras also, there was uh, Toni Morrison, there was um, Carson McCullers. Uh, and and for me, for example, it did feel like New York, uh, the United States was a place where women had more freedom and could be more listened to, respected, where you would have less to constantly prove you're not the intern or the girlfriend. Okay. Uh, there, the, you know, one of the reasons I had to construct my own, quote, city of ladies is because I didn't have role models. I had all male painting teachers. I had the art history texts were all about men. I mean, when I met Anna East, she became a role model for me on so many levels and you know in the 90s there was this i don't know outpouring of feminist criticism against her it was just hideous it was a whole generation of young women who seemed to have absolutely no idea what it was like for a woman of Anna East's generation to have to slowly single-handedly work her way out of the construct of femininity by herself. And they got furious when her unexpurgated diaries were published, and it turned out that she had had two husbands at the same time, okay? <laughs> I'm like, go girl, I can barely <laughs> handle one. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> But, I mean, they did not direct any fury to Louis Kahn, who had three families at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah. And um, Anna East not only encouraged me to write at a time when it was a total taboo for artists to write. You know, if you were disqualified at, at, for being a mother, you were also disqualified if you were articulate, because you were supposed to be inarticulate, mm -hmm. as in the abstract expressionists, you know, like shut up and paint. Mm. Um, it, but she taught me, she was the most gracious human being I had ever met. And after two husbands, that's... Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. That's extra points. But, I mean, she gave me a role model because I was always like really direct and say whatever I wanted. My mother used to get really frustrated with me and she says, do you have to say everything you think? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Am I supposed to be dishonest? And she's like, anyway. Um, Anna East invited me to be in a school that had been created. It was a school without walls that had been created by uh, disgruntled, people in LA, particularly UCLA professors. And there was a launch of the school at somebody's house in Brentwood. And there were four people who were supposed to speak. Me, Anna East, Buckminster Fuller, and Lawrence Durrell, who was a contemporary of Anna East's. And it was set for two o'clock. And Anais and I were on time. <laughs> Lawrence Durrell arrived at 3. Buckminster Fuller arrived at 4. And they started the panel. 
and Buckminster Fuller took over the entire panel and he started striding back and forth in front of the stage saying, when I was 28, I did this. And when I was 32, I did that. And it reminded me just of all my male professors at UCLA. It was so obnoxious. So I raise my hand and I say, Mr. Fuller, Mr. Fuller, can anybody else talk? <laughs> and there was like dead silence in the audience, particularly from the women, because God forbid you should challenge a male authority, right? So he stopped dead in his tracks, and I can't even remember what I said. But, I mean, there was so much fury in the room, and Anna East stood up. And she pointed to him and she said, we have just seen a demonstration of the masculine intellectual energy. And she pointed to me and she said, and we have just seen a demonstration of the feminine intuitive emotional energy. And I thought it, the point of education was to bring these two together. And everybody applauded, and I sat down, and I'm like, oh, she saved my life, because, I mean, they were ready to jump on the stage. But it was her incredible grace. And I'm like, I want to grow up and be like that. Really, I had never encountered that before. But you were not, uh, sorry. Sorry, go you were not pissed about the association with the feminine and the impulsive? This was the 70s, honey. This was way before <laughs> feminist theory and all that. <laughs> now I would never accept it. But then, you must be kidding. But also, I also want to say something about anger. Because, you know, when I discovered all this erased, I, I also, I haven't worked against like any individual theorists or artists or anything. But what I've worked against is the erasure of women's cultural production and contributions. And um, when I discovered that, I got really pissed off. And I agree with you, rage can, can cause depression or can fuel creativity. And obviously, in your case, in my case, it can become really productive, right? Okay. Um, thank you so much. I want to have some time for the audience to ask questions if you are up for it. And uh, let's jump in. And thank you so much. Could you introduce yourself? Okay. Briefly. <laughs> Louise Bernacow. Um, hi, Judy. <laughs> Louise Bernacow. Oh, hi, Louise. Hi, Judy. I'll stand up. I'll stand up. Um, not to take an ounce of angel dust away from you. <laughs> um, I want to say that the, one of the wonderful things about the show, uh, your part of the show, is the beginnings of your artwork in collaboration with other women. I'm going to talk about second wave feminism for a minute. Um, because the project, which you articulated so well, of everything we inherited is bullshit because it's all male, is something I'm sure people know. And if you don't, please go and look at the early days of Judy's work. It was something that was going on in every field. I mean, in mine, it was poetry. Why were poems by women always second class? anthropologist, historian. So it's a political context, a, a, a kind of generational um, sharing of uh, language and what the project was, you know, to replace the masculine whatever with what had been erased by women. So I want to ask the younger women if they feel that they are working in any context beyond themselves. <laughs> and if so, what is it? I mean, uh, the question is, I mean, of course, the con the context of um, 
patriarchy. I think I said it several times. Like, for is is uh, always a force uh, to struggle against. It, it's very clear. I guess maybe the reason why I mean I, I I sense a criticism in your question, but maybe I'm paranoid. But as I said before, I love to work against. So um, I'm going to say like maybe you you perceive. Um, um, the personal and the, the respect of differences uh, matters more for a generation than uh, it did for your generation, right? That is this a little bit the sense of the question, or no? Allies, but what's the question exactly? Well, if you feel you're part of a context or a movement or a, a scene, context, ah, yeah, okay, I think okay. no, that's the question. If you okay. feel you're you're part of a of a larger wave that is going in the same direction, mm, yeah, I do. I, I think, think she's hinting to the fact that she didn't feel that, and she's wondering if there is a sense of solitude or loss in not being part of that. No, no, I think we did. We, I think we do feel that, and I think because of social media, um, like the the. I don't think we feel the need. I mean, I don't know. I'm saying we, but um, I, it's. Um, I think that in social media, uh, politics is such a dominant topic, and it's it's really like a lot of us artists, uh, younger artists, are expressing very strong political opinion every day, and maybe it feel less necessary to talk about it in a situation like this, like now uh, when we talk about our works especially if we are sharing the stage um yeah but but we do feel like a, a really important sense of solarity there, there was a lot of achievement i would say uh, that uh, in recent years uh, both black lives matters and me too um were pushed by women of our generation uh women who some of them lost their job um some of them lost their resources, lost their income. Um, some of them received death threats. Uh, so we do have a sense of a shared community. I think that it's so much part of us. It's so much like in our everyday life that I don't think we feel the need to talk about it in the same way that we we would if we hadn't that constant interaction. Do you agree? Do you differently? I do feel like. Um Community function differently and generations pass. I think that the, I think, I do think that technology has actually fractured communities, ironically. I think social media has actually made communities less tangible because people do rely so much on interacting with, with one another in this kind of, I guess, digital framework or kind of um, everyone does state their views um, digitally as opposed to, or I, I think everyone's constantly communicating so publicly that it's hard for people to have moments where they meet in real life and really form solidarity to one another. I also think that the shift in the arts community and how much has become involved and overlapped in commerce has also affected people's ability to become truly political and also truly have community because the commercial aspect of the current arts arts world, I hate that term, but I don't know what else to say. Um, it creates competition amongst people that would normally be allies to one another. So I don't sincerely feel like people in my generation have the same kind of community that existed in generations past, but I do think that on a fundamental level, people do have sincere goals to push the culture forward and they, join together to do that to the best of their ability. Um, but yeah, I do I do feel like overall people do feel more isolated, but you hear that across the culture, people are, it's a loneliness epidemic, people are feel like they don't have community, people don't go outside their house, I mean, I don't know. But I think that it's not just something that's happening in the art world, it's something that's happening across the West, the culture in the Western world in general, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you so much to all the speakers here and sharing all your insight. Um, Judy's work at Dinner Car. My name is Cara Ciara, and I'm an artist as well. Very much working with the power of the word and trying to help create expansion for 
um, intersectionalism really, you know, humanity rising with the feminine and also ecologically. And so what struck me, I had visit, visited and redid her story four times, you know, 15 years ago, and I found it at the Brooklyn Museum. And what struck me the most was the term humanism being defined and getting so aware of it, I'm aware that, whoa, holy shit, my 25 years of good education, so what, in New York, um, didn't learn so much that humanism was such a celebration of the masculine and such a gender oppression. And so my question is, and my work has been around, how can we create the language of humanism to expand, to hold more space for the feminine and the earth? And so um, I actually wrote a book called The Human Being Book, H-U-W-M-A-N, just, and it's been a conversation with many people across the board of life, ages, cultures, all the things, and it's still a question of, could the word be H-U-W-M-A-N? Is it H-U, it's just not off camera. Is it H-U, is it H-U-W-M-O-N? So the O can hold space for all gender. Is it H-U-W-M-W-A-N? Can you hear me? It's not, I don't know what happened. Did I hit the button? And how do we create language for the feminist to be in construct of the human, the word human, so that human can hold space for everybody? H U W M A N to me is holding space for everybody. H U M A N is just holding space still for, in my uh, connection to the man. I'm and sorry, but that's what I thought feminism was all about. Exactly. So, how can we ex expand feminism into the human construct and the language of the word human? Feminist does not mean female. True. Anybody can be a feminist. Absolutely. And how can we bring that concept into the word, though? I feel like human, because human and humanism, and what I feel like I learned in the her story, the, the timeline, you know, of the erasure of women. And so how can we bring the feminine back into the word human? What do y'all think about that? <laughs> <laughs> question for you, but I'm not, I'm not going to take all the difficult questions first. No, I should not do that. It's a question for all four of you. I know. Yes, so you're all so generation to answer those questions. <laughs> I mean, it's a question in relationship to your exhibition. Yeah. It's like a question for all of us. I don't even know if there is a question. I think we are all in agreement with the methods raised. And we can take another question. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not dismissing the question. Also, I, I would be the wrong person to dismiss the question. <laughs> but I, I do think we are probably all in agreement, and, and in different ways, I think the work of these three artists confront the same question. Um, but maybe we have other questions that are a little easier to tackle right now. No, no, but you need it because it's being filmed. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, what do you believe the future of, future of feminism will be? I mean, feminist world. <laughs> Where there's space for every voice, there's equality for all people, and justice for all creatures on the planet. That is the feminist vision. <laughs> I guess answer the previous question. That's all I was just trying to say. <laughs> Do we have time for one or two more? I think so. Hi, Judy. Hi, I'm Maura Riley. Um, I have a lot of thoughts going through my mind, but I started this day talking to Diane Gellin, who is amazing, who is here, and I want to acknowledge her about the 1976 exhibition curated by Linda Nochlin and Ann Sutherland Harris called Women Artists, 1550 to 1950, that took place at the Brooklyn Museum and then LACMA. First women artist exhibition that we know of at the museum. So the question that I have is, would all of you, and I think I know Judy's answer, <coughs> agree to be in an exhibition that's called Women Artists? And I think it gets back to what Judy, I think, was alluding to earlier because people are afraid of biological essentialism, right? And to be associated with the term woman. And I think, Judy, I'm looking at you, right? I think that's kind of what you're getting at. So I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious 
I just curated an exhibition in London at Mimosa House, and two of the art, it's a feminist art exhibition, and two of the artists that I invited refused to be in it. Um, so it's apropos of those sorts of ideas that I'm, again, to go back to the question, would you be in a woman artist exhibition? Thank you. Yes, I, I would be in one. I, I never really understood why people didn't want to be in those kinds of shows. Um, I've been in those shows. I've also been in shows where all the artists are black. I have some I have some peers that don't participate in those shows, but I don't personally have a problem with doing participating in those shows. I understand the need for that, um, and I think that it's important. I, I would I would not not be in an all American show. I've been in those shows as well. So I just feel like they're just different. I don't think it's necessarily a, a matter of essentialism. I think it's a matter of kind of surmising that people that have had a li similar lived experience, there will be some kind of formal conceptual through line in their practice. So from, from a curatorial perspective, it makes sense to show their work together. That's how I have always imagined it. That's why I feel like it's, a pro it's, it's appropriate. Um, and, and, and so, I don't know, this is my opinion. I don't know how you feel about it. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I don't know, I've done it um, many times, but I also say no many times uh, to the same shows, uh, the title woman. Um, I think for me, it depends on, on the curator and her arguments or his arguments, because I've had show called Women Curated by Male Curators. Um, if the arguments are convincing, it depends, like, the, for example, I found it interesting when the museum is doing uh, hanging with all the women artists in their collection. Because then it unveiled um, often work that had had it not been exhibited, because often women during their lifetime uh, receive achievements, re like receive um, awards, uh, and then it's history who erase them. That's why I love so much the title of your show. It's because really history is the second layer of, that brings women down, and is the most efficient one. And so I, I really I I really like to be in shows. A museum where there's a, the, the collection and you're part of a history, uh, like a house story. It's that kind of show I really enjoy. Well, I, I totally agree about multiple identities, <coughs> about the fact that, you know, we all, I mean, that was one of the advances in terms of thinking around gender from the 70s when we did not like look at. But, although I was aware of the intersection of identities, or I wouldn't have done the painting evidence for white men only. I mean, the intersecting color bars. But the um, exploration of that, I think, has been a, a contribution to thinking and to theory. And the important thing for me is not the title. The important thing for me is the context. So like when I saw uh, the show, All Things This, isn't that what the name of the Pacific Standard Time show at Hammer Museum was in 20, whenever that was? Um, it was all black artists. And it provided a context for understanding some of that work that was simply not understandable when there was a black artist in a sea of white art. Okay, I mean, I think the Studio Museum has made a huge contribution to establishing the context. But, okay, there's a famous story that's been told a lot around the herstory, the uh, city of women, Massimiliano is very fond of talking about how when I tried to get Georgia O'Keeffe's Black Iris, when I wanted to reproduce it in my first book, Through the Flower, O'Keeffe was still alive and she refused because she didn't want to be identified as a woman artist. Now, I only came to understand why many years later when I re-researched all the women on the table on the floor for the dinner party in preparation for its permanent housing because there had been so much new scholarship and I started reading what was written about her work in the 20s and the 30s and it was like 
her images sprang from her womb. No brain, no hand, right? Okay, so Massimiliano says, yeah, well now we got the painting from the Met for the City of Ladies. So I'm standing there when we're installing and looking at the Agnes Pelton and the Hilma Cliff and the Georgia O'Keeffe. And I joked, well, Georgia, sorry, but you're a girl. <laughs> the context changed the perception. So that's what would be important to me, is if what, it, 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 at this point, it's not enough for me, because you know, it's very popular to just group us by a gender or by a race, you know. And the show has to provide a new context for looking for me. That's my answer, Mark. Why okay, are we done? Maybe one last question. <laughs> just <laughs> wait, I just have to tell you the story. When the Donald one? and I saw Bell Hooks speak yeah. in, El in California. And at a certain point, she was speaking, and then she said, I'm tired, and she walked off the stage. And I was like, speechless! I was speechless! Are you going to do that? If there is one last question, we end it on that, I think it's a pretty good answer.